Hi, this is Stephen Cohen with Promote You. This is a living television show where we are able to learn from different people on how to properly promote yourself. Today's guest is going to be Matt Levy. He is a comic, he's a sketch comic artist, uh, he is a survivor. Uh, we're having sound issues. Uh, sorry. And uh, also uh, has a, a show producer. Um, we're going to discuss a lot about him. He's from Arizona. He's been in New York City since 2013. We're going to talk about how he brings creativity to self-promotion and marketing as well. We're going to find out what that means. So let's bring him up. Hey, Matt, how are you? Steven, what's up, buddy? How are you, man? Nothing. I'm good. Did I say your last name correctly? You did. Yeah. You got it. Okay, good. Because that's, uh, that's happened. It's happened before where I've messed up people's last names. Um, so Matt, you hail from Arizona. Where in Arizona do you come from? I'm from central Phoenix. I went to a high school called central high school that John McCain's wife went to. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. Um, that's very, that's very legitimate. Um, yeah. she was, uh, yeah, yeah. Was it a private school or a public school? So it's interesting. Uh, there was a canal in between. I went to the public school, but there's a canal just north of my school and right next to that is a very popular famous expensive private school called brophy college prep that's oh. only for boys and then there's xavier right behind it which is where emma stone and ad bryant went really it's, okay yeah, they all very close okay that's very very cool so very, very cool. how uh were you there uh for all four years of high school yeah, I did all four years at Central. It was great, man. I loved it. It was a cool school. Awesome. And, you know, what did you do after that? Where did you go to college? I stayed in state. I went to Arizona State, ASU. Okay. Big party school. Go Devils. Huh? We, used, we used the shocker. All right. And I uh, ran a TV show there, which was pretty cool. Okay. And it was called Shark Jumpers. <laughs> it's like a sketch show. Okay, and great. I was really, really proud of it. And I did that all four years in the basement of the TV station, pulling right. like all-nighters and then eating gigantic pizzas that were delivered at like three in the morning. How many uh, shows did you uh, create during that four-year span? Well, I mean, there was a bunch of like failed ones, but Shark Jumpers is like the main one. I'm sorry, how many episodes did you create of Shark Jumpers? Oh, um, I want to say six, and then after that, we no longer did episodes after freshman year. We just put out sketch after sketch. Okay, great. Kind of thing, like on the website of uh, the school. Okay. But it was really, really fun, and then I went to film school for my last few years at ASU, which was a trip. Uh, I don't know, what did you study in school, Stephen? Theater. Theater? Yeah, so, yeah. you know the, like, you know, just being with, like a family all the time kind of feel like absolutely 12 to 22 hour days where you're doing nothing but working on whatever your play is and like you're obsessed with it and then you don't know anything else about college life but honestly i wouldn't go back if i could go to back to like one time in my life it would be like being on set of all my friends movies and working for free and just not really having a care in the world other than like making the best movie possible and then like spending hours in the editing room with everybody. It was really uh, fun. Uh, Arizona State University did a very good job on you if you think that you were working for free. You were paying them to work, uh, but <laughs> God bless. It, it is a good time. <laughs> That's true. I actually, well, full disclosure, I got a full ride. Oh, all right. right. You didn't, all right, hey. All right, That's important information. I went to school. It's really easy to get a full ride in state in Arizona, actually. Okay. Um, you take, I, I don't know, where are you from? You're from Florida, right? Yeah. Yeah, originally. I probably could have gotten a free ride here. I wanted to get as far from my family as possible. <laughs> it's a lot harder to get a free ride now in Florida. Florida actually has some of the best schools in the country currently, but at the time, it would have been pretty easy. Yeah. Like, yeah. did you guys have a standardized test that everyone in the state had to take kind of thing? Yeah, I was in the the 99th percentile on it, yeah. um, but it's Florida, you know, it's not. Same I, with Arizona, it's not like it's a big deal. Yeah, I get it. I went to college in uh, Long Island at Adelphi, and I remember bragging about my SAT scores to uh, some of my new classmates, and they were like, hey, it's okay, you still got into the college. <laughs> then they all said there is, and I was like, oh, 
I'm the worst. Should we should we drop our SAT scores? Uh, sure. I don't. You, I think you're younger than I am, so you might have had a time period where there was a uh, no. I'll do the 400 300. Total? no? I'll do okay. Well, I did okay. the 400, but I, I I know my 1600 too. I got a I got a 700 in English and a 600 in math. You beat me. Okay. Well, you know it's not a big deal. I didn't beat those kids in the honors college at Adelphi. So 1300. 1300 is good. I got 1220, which beats George Bush. That's and, great. Uh, <laughs> I remember um, that. just right. George W, not George H W, right? H W right. probably had like a fifteen hundred. That guy, that guy was smart. He was, yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm sure we both beat Trump as well. <laughs> uh, I'm sure Trump paid for somebody else to take that test. Um, but we're we're not here. We're not here to bash a guy that's about to drop out of the race. Um, <laughs> so you you finished college. Was yeah. it strange? You know, you said you'd love to go back to the time. Was it strange moving out of that situation where you were able to? constantly work and not worry about money into real life? Did that have any effect on you? Well, right after college, I knew so many people that were still working on like their thesis movies and I didn't really have anything going on for the first few months. Okay. I produced a friend's movie right after college and um, it was like in really far away Arizona and it was about a pterodactyl. So I had okay. to like, constantly bring this gigantic pterodactyl head in my minivan back and forth like six hour van rides in like crazy monsoon weather it was fucking crazy dude it that, was, uh, but, that, that's not nuts is that uh, up on youtube anywhere i don't even remember the name of it's my friend liz we don't even really talk anymore i forget the name of the movie all right well you know liz but if you're I, ever I, watching I, this please message our, our Instagram handles are both at the bottom. Also, for anybody watching this live, if you have any questions for Matt, please uh, bump them into the comment section. We'd love to uh, find out. And, and please make sure to uh, follow for more of these uh, shows. Uh, so, Matt, um, you know, you, you did college. You made a pterodactyl movie. Um, yeah. what, what ended up bringing you to New York? What was, that, what was that character arc for you? Well, I always wanted to just work for SNL. That was my dream since I was like seven. And then my dad accidentally said one day, you know, all these millionaires in the world, these one percenters, they all wish they could go back to being 25 years old. And I was like, whoa, I'm 25. I'm like living at home. What am I doing? And then two months later, I had an apartment in New York with some of my friends. Okay. That it was that moment that I had the light bulb switch. Um, I for me for moving back to New York, the uh, song by Jay Z uh, came on um, New York. Uh, with the Keys. I heard that I would moved back to Florida to kind of figure out my life, and I was trying to figure out where to go next, and uh, that song did it. But uh, that your your story sounds a lot more meaningful and deep. Uh, <laughs> Dude, that Jay Z song is really powerful. Oh, it's it's beautiful. Who oh, gets me? Alicia Keys when she drops the that hook. That hook, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. amazing. Now you're in New York. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't even stoned when I heard that song the first time. <laughs> I, I I was stoned though. It was amazing. Um, so you've been in New York since 2013, yeah. seven years. Uh, you've done a lot of shows. You've gotten married. Um, yeah. what what haven't you done? What are you looking to do next? That's a really good question, man. I, I love when I hear that on this show. <laughs> what haven't I done? Well, I haven't really been able to uh, move into like a comedy full-time job, which okay. I think everyone wants. Sure. But there is the thing, which is once it becomes your job, I feel like the work that you do starts feeling like it's your job like it looks like someone's day job like the jokes yeah. look like your day job so i'm kind of grateful that i'm still just really into it and not so obsessed with the you know financial aspect of it and i'm fortunate enough to have a temp gig at the moment but i've had steady employment the entire time i've been here but what's next for me i would love to just as much as I said, it kind of ruins it. I, I just want to work for like a talk show or SNL in some capacity as like writer, obviously. 
Yeah. As, as dull and unimaginative as that answer is, that's what I really want to do. But I've met, I've met writers for TV shows, uh, and it doesn't seem like it ruined comedy for them. It may have made it more stressful, but I don't think it really ruins it for you. It just matters how you look at it. It's like people who get married and expect their lives to suddenly completely change because they're husband and wife. You know, it's it's people that have the wrong thinking about it. So I, I think you have a very good thought process on it, Matt. I think you'll be fine. Thanks. Um, I, I think it's a very good goal. Sorry. To piggyback on that, though, I don't think I've said this online and I believe it. I don't think that any talk show or comedy show should hire any white people for the next like three years, to be honest. Okay. I genuinely stand by it. Like we've had our representation. I, I'm happy. We're all okay. Let's start getting something totally fresh and new on TV. I'm totally fine with that as well. I think that's right. a, uh, I think it's yeah. a great idea. I've got a lot, I've got a lot of friends who are not white that are far more uh, talented than me that uh, need to yes. make it. Big. Um, absolutely. White people um, are famously the least funny people. Uh, especially me. Like I'm the least funny of the white people. <laughs> for, uh, for comedy. But if I, if I get hired, I'll take that job because then I feel like I have the ability to bring my friends up. So I'm not going to lie. I'll, I'll do that, but only so right. I can get Danny Suggs uh, hired. Uh, as well eventually, and then he can become a showrunner, and then I'll just write for his show. Um, Danny, if you're watching, I want to write for your show someday. So um, let's move into let's move into the promote you part of the show. Um, sure. We're going to talk about stuff that you've done in promotion, stuff that you've done in marketing, and try to learn from it. Um, you are you're very creative about your promotion, and this is something we haven't discussed on the show: is using creativity to make your promotion and your marketing better. I'm sure we'll run into other aspects that we have discussed on the show, uh, like relationships, like consistency, but I really want to make sure we get into creativity with you. So you have a, uh, a blog, basically, I'll call it, called a profile about you. Is blog the correct word for it? What would you call it? Um, yeah, it's a Medium account that essentially doubles as like a template for whatever kind of PR that you want. So if you want me to do an inter an interview style thing with you, mm -hmm. I'm happy to do that. If you want me to write like a New Yorker style profile about you, I'm happy to do that. If you want a review of your podcast or of a movie that you've written, so you have some PR about you, I'm happy to do that. I want people to have you know like something that they can show agents and managers. And cool. it seems like there's no real place to have that done in kind of a legitimate way. So I was like. Why not fill this void for cheap? Absolutely. I mean, I also think that, you know, when you're talking about trying to get yourself out there, it's really important to make sure that you show up on Google uh, keywords. You know, when you type in Steve Cohen, there's going to be a million Steve Cohens you find before me. So I'm going to have to go and get my name out there and different things to start to show up on the internet. Um, so what you're doing is really providing a service for people in that way, which is interesting. Um, I also thought it was really interesting, uh, you know, that you're promoting other people instead of promoting yourself. Um, do you, you know, do you just do it so that you can sleep at night for all of the bad things you do? Like, are you just doing this good thing to make up for that? Why, you know, why are you being so nice? Um, well, Steve, with every person that's nice, you know, there's a little bit of selfishness in there. It's not a totally selfless act. Uh, I do make a little bit of scratch off of it, not a ton. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, um, I don't even necessarily think it's all that nice per se. It's a, I think of it as a service really like that I thought was totally needed mm -hmm. in, in the comedy community. Sure. Um, and, uh, first of all, I actually don't even put my name on it just so like, it seems like it's promotion, but it, it's just like this thing that is not really even tied to a human being almost like just so these people have this, platform where it looks totally legitimate, which I think it is because I'm writing about this stuff as if I actually love it, which I do. I mean, uh, but I do it because um, I really wanted someone to write about me, you know, forever, right? Don't we all? Like, yeah. we all, I read profiles and biographies and I'm like, God, if someone just did something like this about me, it would be so meaningful to me. And I was like, why don't I just do it for other people? Because they're probably thinking the same thing. Everyone is thinking, how come the Interabang isn't writing about me? How come the AV Club isn't writing about me? 
How come I haven't been in Vulture's Follow Friday? I'm as funny as these people. I just say, yeah, no matter who you are, you're incredible. Let's make something about you right now. So what I do is I send people a questionnaire so they say exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. um, and then I kind of fashion it into something that is something you may read in a newspaper or like on the last page of uh, the New Yorker, like an interview style thing. And then I send it to them and I let them have final draft because it's, hor I feel like people always have their words misinterpreted when they're published in the New York times and they're constantly scrambling for PR. But when you and I have like, you know, not much cachet in the comedy world, it's kind of nice to like get the exact message you want out there and then say you do have that fortuitous meeting with an agent or manager and be like, hey, you can actually just read this right here. It's more than my bio on my website. Someone wrote this about me. Mm -hmm. It's just like, oh shit, this person has a web series that's been reviewed and it's a legitimate review. Like this person watched all two hours of this website or, or excuse me, of this web series or they combed through this guy's entire podcast history and read everything and listened to everything and then kind of did an actual comprehensive review, treating it like it was an actual gigantic release that would be reviewed in Vulture. So I like, I think everyone needs this kind of service and I would love that it grew beyond just a medium account and I could hire more freelancers to also write about people. And then everyone just has stuff written about them. It may cheapen it if everyone has stuff written about them, but why? Why not just have everybody get their thing out there? Like, there's there's no shame. I feel like there's no shame. Like, not at all. We're all we're all just scrambling for a piece of the pie, and the pie keeps getting smaller and smaller. So I feel like let's you know build some cakes. There's other desserts to be had, dude. Yeah, we can, we can we can change. It can all the whole industry can be changed. And I feel like, especially I'm sure you feel this way too during quarantine things have sort of shifted in different ways. People are doing things a little more DIY and creatively. Yeah. And I think before, this is before we get to that, I want to, I just stick with profile yeah. about you for one second. Cause something sure. that pops out to me is that um, you've done something very creative in creating a profile about you. You found this need and you filled it yourself. This need for people who are trying to get to the next level to be uh, interviewed, to have information, get out about them. Um, but you've done it in a way that's been done before. And yet that's still creative. Thank you. you know, there's nothing new under the sun as something one of my old acting coaches used to say. You're taking from what other people are doing, but you make it creative by putting your own spin on it. And that's what you've done here. And that's what's really important for people uh, like me who are trying to learn how to promote more effectively to see I can take a skeleton and put my own flesh on it. I mean... What you just said is absolutely true. Like, I did not come up with this in any way. Profiles have existed forever. It's like my favorite kind of literature, basically. I love reading them. Um, but uh, the coolest part about all of it, um, in terms of, uh, you know, promoting myself, mm -hmm. is I don't get clicks because uh, I promote this in any way. It's amazing because people are promoting my website in turn for me, which sure. is nuts. I've never had that before. Like I've done tons of videos and sketches and the actors will post it and it does okay. But when people have a profile written about them, it's very personal. It's not like just an acting gig, it's their story. And I really try to honor it and take it very seriously because it's not something to be joked about unless they want it to be tongue in cheek, which I'm happy to do as well. But then when I do it, people will pay to have these profiles sponsored and they'll get thousands of views. And it's like, they're just showing off my work for me and it, they're proud to. It's, it feel, it's so much more gratifying to see a friend of mine. Um, I don't know if you know Adam Mueller. Yeah. He was, he was the first one to really like promote it. Okay. Um, and I was just like, I just saw the pouring of comments of people saying, Adam, I didn't know you were doing this. Uh, I didn't know you, uh, had uh, left banking or uh, the finance world. And, really? And the, they didn't like, know that? I, I was just connected to all these comments and it was just wow. like, 
really personal. And I was like, man, this feels way more meaningful than any comedy stuff I've ever done about myself. Like I'm, I'm doing something with other people and I really enjoy it and love it. Um, Adam Mueller is a great guy. He is. Um, he is. I'm not even saying that. Shout, out to, Mueller. Shout out to Mueller. Um, wonderful guy. Uh, who so far has had the most views of any of these profiles? Um, Joe Naughton has the most views. Okay. And did Joe uh, advertise on uh, social media? Okay. I think he had his post sponsored and um, his is kind of like more about education and a lot of teachers got really invested in it. Really? Yeah. I, it's just that kind of thing. Like you don't, you don't know what you're getting into with these things. No, it's great. I've heard from a lot of social media managers that if you have an interest outside of your main interest, make sure people know about it on social media. Like if you are a uh, trans rights activist who also likes do it yourself pottery, put up your do it yourself pottery once a week and let people know that you are a full complex human. You're not just an issue that you're fighting for. You're not just a stand up comic. You have also got an adorable cat like Liz Mealy does. Yeah. Uh, her cat posts are legendary. They're, they're amazing. Um, she finds other people's cats and posts them. They're great. Speaking of Liz Mealy, have you had her on the show? She was the first person that was on Instagram live though. So I'd love to get her on the YouTube format, but she's, an amazing interview. Um, I barely had to talk. She had everything ready. I mean, you're doing a very good job, but oh. Liz Mealy, wow. <laughs> I know Liz is great. Um, she introduced me to lizard mail, her invention, which I started using, but no one signed up for when I used it. <laughs> but Do you I want to explain lizard mail. She didn't talk about that. On she the didn't show. even talk about lizard mail. No, no. She oh. was talking about social media and social media only. Oh, wow. You want to give it a quick 10 second uh, elevator pitch? It's a little longer than that, but basically I worked at Caroline's for a little bit and I went to every single show when I was there mm -hmm. and she opened for Hari Kondabalu. Yeah. And when she would open, she would close her set by uh, put, uh, showing the audience a little card that she would give out mm -hmm. and a phone number and she would just leave them at all the tables. And if you wanted to get her dates, or more about her blog, just sign up for the mailing list there rather than you know putting a mailing list out at the merch yep. table at the end, which yeah. you know leads to a lot of kind of compiling of email addresses you can't really read. And it was genius. And it's like 10 bucks a month to do it. And it's like a $5 flat fee and then 12 cents for every person that signs up or something like that. And it's just all sent to you in a CSV file. It's like brilliant. The only people that signed up were my wife and my parents. So they're on the mailing list now. <laughs> nice. You've got them. Yeah. Um, this it's still a great idea. Though. Across the world because of it. Yeah. No, she's she's done an amazing job. Um, and that's kind of something that Dustin Chafin talked about uh, when he was on. Uh, the idea that they used to send out mailers. They would, they would send out postcards. And I feel like that's something comics can still do. You can still hand out a little card with your information on it as people are leaving the show. Like, Go and try to collect as much attention as possible. Um, speaking of social media uh, and experiments, um, you you use Twitter as a social media experiment. Um, you know where where you give tips to people to get followers. Um, does that piss people off? Are they like, hey, dude, get out of here with your tip explaining? Uh, or are they appreciative? Like, how does that how does that work for you? That's a good question. Again, Stephen, amazing questions. Uh, <laughs> um, well, you're already, on the, you're already on the show. You don't need to. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone's ever been mad at me for like being kind. Nice. I, I, occasionally, it comes across as maybe insincere or like braggadocious, but I've used these techniques to get followers because I'm just a guy. But basically, what I would do um, is. I would find an account similar to mine. Mm -hmm. and I may not have even really come up with this myself. It might've been my friend, Nate Borgman, that talks about it with me. Okay. Um, but uh, we both know Dan Wicks. Yeah. Someone like Dan Wicks, who has just a few more followers than me, like a, couple, a thousand or so more. Um, you see a tweet of Dan's that's really funny. And then I go in and I follow a bunch of people that liked that tweet. Because I'm like, oh, that, if they like that joke, they'll probably like some of the stuff that I write. And in that case, I tweeted 
uh, just kind of a step-by-step -step guide to doing this. I was like, if you like this tweet by me you know, and you're looking for more followers, why not just follow all the people that like this tweet? And we can kind of create like a community where everybody sort of likes the same stuff. And uh, occasionally that works. One time I said, if you're a comedian, like this post and 500 people liked it and everyone followed each other. So it wow. just kind of builds this weird little community. And then uh, there's another one where I said, uh, at the beginning of quarantine, I would give out money to the best stories um, for certain types of prompts. Like I would say, what's your best celebrity encounter? And that blew up. Um, and I was just like shocked. I was like, I can't believe 700 people told me their favorite story. Like, but quarantine brain, it, it goes in spurts. Like at first we're like super online and then I feel like there's times where people are like, all right, we should back off a little bit. Yeah. And now it feels like we're kind of coming back to what feels like the first couple weeks of quarantine again, oddly enough. Does it feel sort of like that to you? I feel like we're yeah, coming. It feels like we're in a cycle. Yeah. Um, it does. It does feel like we're in a cycle. I feel um, like we're back to the first, like when quarantine felt new and fresh, oddly enough. Um, speaking of just to what you were just talking about, um, for our viewers that are watching live right now, if you have any questions besides Rebecca, um, well, Rebecca can ask too, uh, please type in your comments, your questions into the comments. And also if you're not subscribing currently, uh, please subscribe here and also make sure to follow Matt. His Instagram handle is uh, matter a day underscore night underscore, uh, Levy. Um, so Matt, uh, the next thing that you do that I think is really interesting and creative is a, uh, post called comedy stray notes, oh, yeah, you do this comedy stray notes post every week. Um, I've been in it two weeks in a row, um, but only cause yeah. I keep inviting you on stuff cause I want to hang out <laughs> with you. Um, how did comedy stray notes come about and has it, um, been beneficial for you and getting, you know, attention over to yourself, meeting other people? Um, great questions again, Stephen. Also, I just have a quick question. Is yeah. Monkey in Heaven a reference to this monkey's gone to heaven? It is. It is. It is. I've got a uh, tattoo for it. I don't know if the internet can see, but I've got a, I've got a tattoo for it. Bad Jew, great song. Um, <laughs> uh, I have a mashup for you, actually. Um, All right. This monkey's gone to the opera. That's really great. It's, very, it it's very morbid uh, and morose, but I like it. Um, either way, Back to that, uh, Comedy Stray Notes actually started with, um, I went to a screening of my friend's movie. Do you know um, Seth Pompey? Not personally, I don't know the name. Seth Pompey put out a feature length documentary in January, 2019 okay. about Alan Shane and Gary Marinoff okay. called Hysterical and it's incredible. I don't know if you're familiar. Are you familiar with Alan Shane? No, no. Alan Shane was a legendary middle-aged open micer who uh, would get on stage and he would have his phone up to his face like this when he performed because he was taping himself. And he would tell jokes about hot buckets of cum. That was like every punchline. It's the first time cum's been said on this show. Um, <laughs> and. Gary, I'm, glad you broke that, I'm glad you broke that boundary. Well, it was, it was the spirit of Alan. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Gary, uh, they would call him Gary. Um, he was an extra in 30 Rock. He has a few lines in Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Okay. But they both died inexplicably within a couple of weeks of each other in June 2015. But Seth had been making this doc about both of them for years and he had all this footage compiled and then he put on a screening at film forum on the lower east side and it was yeah. like this weird reunion of comics that i hadn't seen since like 2013 and i was like whoa this is trippy it was amazing robert smigel was there and i met robert smigel with uh steve mr jokes Whalen, who recently passed away we like ran after him to meet him and i was like i gotta write about this and i was like i should just write about the show i was on that week too because Joe List was on that show that I was on. And I was like, 
I kind of want to brag about that. And then I was like, I kind of want to tell people about what I've been up to. And I kind of want to talk about what I did on Twitter. And no one really does anything like this other than uh, Jeffrey Gurian. But no offense to Jeffrey, his kind of sucks. Anyway, I thought I could make it like a little more interesting and I could tag a bunch of people and I would turn it into praise about folks. And uh, it was like, I want to make it like a quarter self-promotion and like 75% promoting others and what they're doing and the cool stuff that's going on in the community and movies that I've seen. And cause I'm just like a massive comedy obsessive outside of just performing myself, like obsessed beyond uh, a healthy comprehension, like how much I enjoy just consuming content. And uh, I just decided to make this thing happen. And the first major benefit that happened was I made it very well known that I was the guy that brings a DSLR to like literally everything. And for a nominal amount, depending on the length of the set and how far like the track was out there, I would tape people's sets. Yeah. Um, because everyone wants to get their five minutes taped, but there wasn't really like a guy in the scene that did it. So that was like my first big coup from uh, Stray Notes. And I must've taped like 70 sets last year. And then this year I taped a few, it, it kind of dropped off a little bit, but it was a nice little thing. And I started getting to know people better because of that. And a lot of people, honestly, I think it was the smartest thing I ever did in comedy because, you know, as a comic, I am average. I am nothing special, but as a community kind of bringer together thing guy, I think I'm, okay, it praise, I'm good at praising people in a place where we're all, myself included, narcissists, <laughs> that others are doing great things. Other people sometimes write like nice little posts, but I try to make sure that I do it every single week. Because, you know, every, everyone deserves, everyone's doing cool stuff and no one's writing about them. And then a profile about you is just an extension of that in a much yeah. greater, uh, more focused way. So let's talk about relationships for a moment. It's something that comes up on the show a lot and you just, I think hit the nail on the head that it's one of the most important things, not just in promotions, but any kind of business, whether it's entertainment or not. Yeah. You were, you were, you're using that both, both of those to create relationships with other people, people that might not have known you before. Uh, you might've just been another face in a, a crowd of uh, comics. You know, now they know who you are. They're following you on Instagram, Twitter, you're friends with them on Facebook. If you see them at a show, you can say, Hey, you know, we never met before, but we talked on the phone or, hey, the last time I saw you, blah, blah. And you're no longer a stranger. How important has that been for your career? Um, I don't think there's been any major career jump, but it has been important and that people uh, recognize like I was more of like a fixture in the scene where people are like, Oh, can't do that joke around Levy. Cause he's going to write about it kind of thing. Like okay. I didn't do before quarantine, but I would yeah, I'd write about what happened at Mike's occasionally because sure. it's stuff that just gets lost in the sands of time is what I, how I feel about everything. I try to write everything down because like it's crazy, but in a month, you're not going to remember what you had for lunch on Monday, June 29th. You're not going to remember much about today. It all just gets lost. So to me, even more so than like the fostering of relationships, it was like, I feel like the scene kind of needs this documentarian almost to say what happened that, that week in comedy and notice the cycles. And to some people really, some people really like it. There's been some things where I've written where people are like, can you please remove that? And I have. I saw a girl do a set, um, and I don't even know if it was about me because I wasn't friends with, but she was like, if anyone puts me in their fucking newsletter, I'm going to be furious. And I was like, well, I guess I'm not writing about her. But uh, stuff like that happens. Like uh, I wrote about uh, an unnamed comic, and it was mentioned in the same breath as another comic, and I didn't know they had feuded for years. And I removed one of them because it didn't feel right. So stuff like that happens. Like I learned more and more about the community. Yeah. And sometimes when you feel like an outsider, which I mean, when you come to New York, the first year is 
really feeling like the new kid in the worst way possible where everyone's like, Ugh, you're just another body here. You don't add anything of value. It was nice to find, okay, I do actually sort of add something of value to this scene of, you know, misfits. Like we're all just, we all literally want the exact same thing. Absolutely. And I figured I am not the best and I know my limitations and I want to embrace a different side of my skill set that other comics aren't really ever getting in touch with because they're just all about, please listen to my album. Yeah. Come to my show. Yeah. I'm taking my hour. And after a while, to me, I was just like, I'm tired of writing that about myself. I would much rather write that Steve's doing a one man show or something like that. And Steve's doing this podcast about promotion that Steve's working really hard on, but no one else is really noticing. And he's, he's trying so hard and he's written so much about it, but you know, why not someone else besides just a guest on the podcast write about it? like it's, it's nice. It feels good. It feels better than writing about myself is yeah. the major I, benefit from it. I think it's Stephen Jay Gould, uh, the philosopher that used to speak about altruism uh, and how, you know, people help each other to benefit themselves. I guess um, you know, even, even if you're not getting some specific currency benefit out of helping other people, there's just an emotional benefit to helping other people. Um, speaking of Kristen Seltman uh, in the comments just wrote Matt Levy exclamation mark all caps. So, I mean, you must be doing something right if Kristen Seltman uh, likes you. That's, Dude, that's a positive. She is great. Um, there's so many awesome people uh, in the New York City comedy scene. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. Has um, Chris been on the show? Uh, no, I actually asked a group that we're in, you know, does anyone know anyone? Does anyone want to be on it? And Kristen Seltman did not ask to be on the show. So she's very humble. I, I can see her feeling like, you know, she doesn't uh, want to come on because she's too humble. But she is welcome. She is welcome to come on and be interviewed. Um, I have some legal questions for her, too. So she can really knock out a lot of things for me. Can um, we talk about humility for a second? I think it's the weirdest thing in the world. Because okay. Especially in comedy, I'm obsessed with the idea that we all have to be humble. Like we we don't want to, but we're all constantly promoting ourselves. It's a very weird fine line to walk. Like we're all obsessed with this promoting this image of humility. Like don't want to, you know, uh, self promote too much. But here's this thing, kind of. But it's it's very it's always been this weird like lingering thought in my mind with. Why are we all raging narcissists pretending to be humble all the time? It's it's so bizarre, and I, I that is kind of, that was another big inspiration for a profile about you. I was like, you know what, this exists so I can be your true ego, and actually say what you really think about yourself through a filter of another human being saying it, as opposed to the you know false humility that we all put on all the time. Yeah, where I'm like oh, I'm just. I'm okay, you know, I'm, I'm just an average comic kind of thing. You know, that humility that we're all, but we're all in our heads think we're fucking awesome, which we are, but yeah. we all tell ourselves, you can't say that in public. Everyone will hate you. There's a way, there's a way to go about it. Um, by the way, Rebecca likes you. Um, I just found out I can put this on the screen and Anna is also nice. Um, so... So, I mean, speaking towards that humility, I find a lot of my friends, I, I have a background in sales. Um, I used to be not humble, but embarrassed of talking about myself, of letting people know what I was doing. I would do it anyways, because I knew I had to, but I felt so bad about myself and about doing it that it felt uncomfortable. It took me years to get past that. I think that I, I agree with you absolutely. You know, you do have to be humble to a certain extent to exist inside of this field because people will say, "Oh man, what what an asshole," and you don't want that. But on the other hand, um, I think that you do have to find some sort of a balance where you can let people know, you know, what you're doing and why it's important to know what you're doing. Um, I remember uh, my ex. Uh, who also wonderful, wonderful person, Emily, um, was having a conversation with her friend about politics. And they both agreed that men needed to just step out of the way so that women could take political offices. And I said, 
no, we just need to push for you know women to win the elections. Like men stepping out of the way just means a more awful man is going to come in and try to step in and take that position. There's always a worse man ready, ready to step into that you know void. So we just need to push for the right people to make it. And that's what you were saying earlier is we need to make sure that there's diversity getting hired uh, by these TV shows. I mean, not be hired anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's um it's you know very strange. Uh, when shows are all written by the same, you know, group of people. Um, I want to get to a couple more things before uh, we go, because we're almost at the 45 minute mark, but you can always come back on another time. Um, you've been doing comedy therapy with people. Uh, what the heck is comedy therapy? Well, I realized that the profiles are nice, but there is like a little financial barrier to it. And in addition to that, there is the process where you have to write a questionnaire about yourself. But I also thought, in addition to having something written about me, um, and I also want to talk about the idea of the agent as the ego uh, as well. But something that I feel like all comics are obsessed with is the idea of having representation. And the therapist, in my mind, was essentially the serve the purpose that I want to say a manager would. So if I was your manager, what would I talk to you about with your career? And we'd discuss your goals at great length. And it seemed like a worthy conversation to have with comics because once again, this comes back to the humility that I'm obsessed with. We are constantly not telling each other about our goals and comedy dreams, even though we're all in it together because A, you feel like, oh God, I just told someone my dream. They're going to copy my dream and do the same thing better than me. But I was like, wouldn't it be nice if you could just tell me everything you really want to do by 2030 and what you accomplished in the 2020s? Can we figure out how you do that? And if you realize, hey, maybe I don't actually like stand up, but I love just doing this radio show. How can I monetize that? And just talk to you at length about that. Not necessarily. Or if you want to talk about how like, hey, I don't really have that many friends in comedy. Why do you think that is? Uh, it could literally be whatever you want it to be. It doesn't matter. But I just want to, you know, love talking about comedy more than anything. And I thought, why not do it in a way that's more focused than kind of like the old humble walk around thing where we're like, oh, I want to do this. And what are you up to? I was like, no, let's just focus on you for once, uh, whoever you may be. And I'll treat you like a, a professional client. Uh, maybe I want to get into a manager type position and this felt like a way to talk to people in a way that was really genuinely honest. And I honestly pissed a few people off because I was a little too honest with them about their goals. Um, but in a way it felt really therapeutic once again and altruistic because I was just like staying up till 3 a.m. messaging friends saying, dude, if you want to write the packet, you just got to write the packet and I'll read the packet for you. I don't care, but you can't just talk about it forever kind of thing. As a lot of people just like, well, I've been sitting on this pilot forever or I'm never going to write the pilot. And it's a lot of people that are like, have so many ideas, but a lot of comics are just afraid to be self starters, myself included. Like I have 10 projects I want to do, but you just need someone to, I need somebody to constantly be, messaging me like, hey, did you get to the page 10? Yeah, there's Justin. Justin was a great club. Justin's my dude. It's free. I don't care. I don't, I'm thinking about making money off of it someday, but right now I have no experience figuring mm -hmm. out, well, talk to friends and figure out what they actually want to do and see if I can help them. Like, yeah. we all want to be, I want to be Judd Apatow. I don't want to be Pete Davidson or Seth Rogen. I want to be the guy that helps people see their dream come true. And then they just get all the dreams that they happen. And then I was the guy that was there for them. You know, Adam Sandler might not be just, might not be Adam Sandler if it wasn't for Apatow hanging out with him and kind of like writing for him and pushing him. And yeah. I want to be that guy for Stephen Cohen. I want to be that guy for Justin Smith. If, you know, Kristen, who's might be watching, wants to just chat about her career and where it's going and how she could incorporate like being a lawyer into her comedy and maybe doing like funny legal stuff. Let's talk about it. I'm cool with that. If Rebecca wants to talk about like uh, t 
taking her videos to another level. Sure, I fucking love Rebecca's videos. I would be happy to talk about that. Those and videos are so funny. Yes, I know. Rebecca should be viral. Why isn't she viral? Let's let's talk about it. Like, that's what I'm here for, man. I'm here to make everybody's dreams come true. And it's so much more fun to talk about what you guys want to do than myself. It's 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 a joy. It's it's, it's fun. Um, so we hit the 45 minute mark, and I, I'm supposed to. Uh... I'm supposed to uh, kind of keep things for 45 minutes because that's the that's the attention span that people apparently have is is 45 minutes. But um, if I, about the audience members, they might be into it. Yeah. Well, I, I do I do want to ask um, a couple of uh, deeper questions, and I might have to have you back on to get to the other stuff. We we just had too much to talk about. But what failures, what challenges have you run into in promoting and marketing that you just never solved? You never got it figured out. And you're still trying to figure it out to this day. Is there anything like that out there in your mind? Um, yeah, I would say when I ran a show, I could never just do a show without a gimmick, which I know we were going to talk about, but I was always deathly afraid of doing shows without gimmicks. My first big show that I ran in New York was called It's Everybody's Birthday, where I treated it as if everyone in the audience was celebrating their birthday. Like if you came to the show, it was your birthday. I didn't care. Everyone got cake. We sang to literally every single person in the audience. I only booked comics who were celebrating that birth their birthday that month. <laughs> it was a party every single time. It was a little lame at times. And me and my co-host, Jesse, we would do bits in between. We never did stand up on the show. We had literally just did birth, we forced ourselves to do birthday trivia uh birthday roasts of concepts like birthday candles we roasted and stuff like that we they did. had it coming they they had it coming birthday yeah. candles were the worst yeah <laughs> it was it was but i was deathly afraid of doing a show without a gimmick because i was just like why would anyone come i didn't you know I, appeal I, gotta, I gotta tell you that's like you went into an interview and somebody's like what's what's the what's the you know worst thing about employing you and you're like well i'm always early but but fair <laughs> enough Fair enough. It's a, no, it's a good like, I don't think there's anything interesting about me per se. Like I don't know why anyone would want to come back. So I wanted to really overproduce. And then I did another show called Free Fries where I gave out fries to the audience. I did another show called uh, The Comics Table Presents where we gave out presents every show in between comics. So every show there had to be a gimmick and we would hand out tickets outside uh, instead of flyers, and I said, "Hey, no matter what the show was, it was that people were being ent entered into a raffle, which I always thought was a much easier way to get people to come into a show when they thought they had the opportunity to win something. Because there's that tension that it's about them rather than just watching seven random amateur comics do their thing. So that actually works a little bit too. But I was always like, if I don't do all of these extra things, no one's coming, and I was right." <laughs> uh, a lot of times I had fairly empty shows too. It's not like every show was packed. Uh, Rebecca was on them. Kristen was on them. Uh, some of them were pretty bad, but I always tried very hard. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I, you know, what, uh, what challenges and failures did you have where you ran into it, it didn't work the first few times, you made a change, you found a solution, and then it started working great? Um, well, I would say put you on the spot. A chat within comedy or just in promotion? Within promotion and marketing. Did you ever run into a situation where you were just like, this isn't working, but then you figured out what change you needed to make and you made it happen? Like maybe the first few times you, you know, wrote comedy stray notes, you weren't getting the response you wanted. So you changed the you know way you were doing them or uh, with a profile about you. Well, the thing about Stray Notes is it took off right away. So it kind of varies in how it does, and I don't really have any attachment to it doing well online in any way because it's not really about me. Um, but uh, I look back at the old ones, and they're written really sloppily. Like, if you go back way back in the archives, they're way worse. And I imagine in a year or two, I'll look back at these and be like, oh, God, these suck. But... Um, Either way, uh, that wasn't really a challenge. I would say, like I well, said, I think, I think that counts. You found, you figured out that your, you know, product was sloppy. It wasn't what you wanted, and you changed it. And you made it less sloppy. That 
that's what I'm looking for. That's exactly. I, it. If you have another one, you can answer it too. But that's great. I do, and it's okay. a little more interesting actually. Okay. Uh, I was talking. We were talking about the first year in New York comedy, mm -hmm. and I'm very green. You know, uh, I've been doing stand up in Arizona regularly for just a year. I had done it when I was in high school for two years and just did sketch for seven years. And then I was like back into stand up full fledged. And then I moved to New York and I thought I was the shit like everyone does when they move to New York and they think they're going to be the guy. And I wasn't. And I wrote a very embarrassing Facebook status after friending everyone in the scene that I met. I wrote, um, if you're a comic like this status, because if you're a comic, you never like my statuses. I wrote that and you know, it was very embarrassing after I put it out into the world. Like uh, I it existed and I uh, had to like deal with how weird that sentiment was with, you know, people that I would see the very next day at Mike's. But that was easily the biggest challenge because I was like, now I'm a, a thing but I'm a bad thing. Like I went from being a forgettable guy that went last in every group in a mic to the guy that was like, Oh, this guy just kind of really is hostile and weird. So, um, let's, let's, uh, talk about this, this one last thing and then we'll, uh, we'll move on and I'll, I'll have you back on and talk about the other stuff. But you, sure. you had this situation where you were very embarrassed, where you, you put out this information, yeah. Um, you, you felt uncomfortable about it. Other people felt uncomfortable about it. You're still in the comedy scene. You still have lots of friends that you've made. Kristen, Stalin, Jeff, and Ray. Uh, right. Everyone forgot about it. Yeah. How, how did you make everyone forget about it? I think I might've just deleted it. <laughs> it was really but, big. <laughs> but it, it took, it took some time and you went back yeah. to being the side of you that you like, that you feel comfortable with, that you're not embarrassed about. And it just took some time and you passed through it, right? I just feel like a lot of people need to hear that. They do something embarrassing or bad. I know I could have used to hear that in my 20s. You do something embarrassing or bad, you apologize for it. I guess you delete it. Unless it's on Instagram, never delete anything on Instagram. Instagram hates that, it'll hurt your algorithm. Just yeah. archive that, archive it. Yeah, cool. they'll ding you for about two months if you delete anything. Huh. Yeah. You've deleted things, that's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I talked to social media managers and they said no. But I, I just think that that's really important is if you do something embarrassing, uh, move on. Uh, Kristen Seltman says she liked that status and uh, she'd do it again. Um, so but I mean, it's really weird being here for the first couple months. And oh, Rebecca was on the show, I think, and killed it. Yeah. Um, I'm just. Just putting up some things that I missed here. I didn't even know this is the first show where I figured out that I could do this. I had no idea that I could Great. show these comments. This is much better. Um, you've never done anything embarrassing. She doesn't believe it. Um, uh, yeah, I definitely did. I have done so many embarrassing things that are not even comedy related. Me but, too. Uh, me too. Uh, yeah, I, I think that first couple of years when you're trying to make a name for yourself is very awkward. Yeah. And when you have a moment where you're like, I'm not going to be humble, I'm going to be say what I really, really think. Mm -hmm. and not care is very revealing and then shows your real self. And I think I read something interesting recently, which is uh, the most worthy things to write about are the most embarrassing things because that's like, you know, the most honest and revealing stuff and most interesting for yeah. any type of readership. And uh, after I did it, I certainly felt a little more comfortable. I was like, okay, the worst thing has happened. I'm still going to go in the last group at Mike's and, you know, go to Pine Box and be bomb my face off so hard. But it was cool to get that out of the way. And I was like, this is probably what rock bottom feels like. And they can't. <laughs> um, Matt, uh, you've been a great interview. Thank oh, you so much for uh, coming on today. Is there anything that they, is there anything that you are doing right now that you want to let people know about? Um, yeah, I, in addition to comedy therapy, which if anybody really wants to do it or doesn't, or is kind of hesitant about it, please just hit me up. I'm happy mm -hmm. with anybody all the time, yourself included. Um, it's just Thank literally you. a conversation about you. Uh, please do that. If you want a profile written about you, happy to do that. 
if uh, you want to be in comedy stray notes, just let me know what you're doing. I'm happy to write about you. Uh, basically, I just want to promote others. Um, the only thing of mine that I want to promote is I have become like a mashup artist over uh, quarantine, and I make mashups because Girl Talk's my favorite thing in the world after okay. it. My two heroes of heroes. All right. So, uh, I've been making mashups, and if you're interested, you can listen to uh, The Magic of Closing Time, which I think is one of the coolest mashups ever made, and I made it. Can you uh, put the URL in the comments after this? Because these, these yeah. comments apparently vanish, but when it posts on YouTube, if you can put that in there, sure. so people can see it. Um, I, have, I have it right here. Awesome. Um, Everybody, thank you so much for chilling out with us. If you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe. Um, I've got a uh, show tomorrow with Rebecca Kaplan. I'm hosting her show at 7.30 p.m. Message me for the deets. And I've also got my game show, WTF Steve, at 9 p.m. on Facebook Live, also on Zoom. So message me if you want to watch that. Uh, Matt, again, you've been wonderful. Um, thank your uh, wife for letting us have the apartment. She's wonderful. Uh, let her know that Kristen and Rebecca both complimented her. Uh, uh, thank you, Yersella. I don't know if I say your name right, Yersella. I hope I do. Um, Rebecca says these comments don't vanish, but they did last week, so I don't know. We'll see. Interesting. We'll see. They uh, moved to the live chat replay box. Okay, neat. I'm learning stuff. Dude, okay. thanks to Rebecca and Kristen and Justin for Thank you. Watching. And Yersella, too, for watching all the time. It's been great. All right, Matt, I'll see you soon. Later, man. Bye, Bye buddy. Peace, soon.